Uh, yeah, but I'm not arguing with you, but now remember the key for restoration originally was conservation. Right. And it was to, uh, like I sold a book, uh, the Detective Pounding Today from the Golden Age, that had a piece of tape all the way down the spine because the cover had literally split in two. And the, the collector certainly was saw it. I mean, it was tape right there, and I told him about it. He was just happy to have that comic book in a price that he could afford. And the original thing wasn't like, oh, how do I press this little tiny wrinkle out? Or how do I replace this little rusty staple? It was always like, how do I keep this thing from falling apart? And the earliest conservation was always kids. You know, uh, somebody who's eight years old reads the book to death, passes it on to his little brother. Tape his little brother reads it, it, tape it. You know, so-and-so writes their name on it. You know, it's, it's all... It's all just to keep it from falling to shreds. Um, but uh, as far as as far as investment grades, um, oh, uh, here's another thing I wanted to touch on, and John can explain this more because he's been around more of the pedigree things as they came out in the '90s. But do you mind talking a little bit about like where thing you know where in the country it comes from will determine things like you know, page quality uh, and sure. um, you know when he, when when we talked about you want to dry cold, dark place. Where I'm from, Richmond, Virginia, we've got a huge river, the James River, cuts right through town. And so, regardless of how great a book is, it will always, always be creamed off white if it's better than 40 years of age. I mean, it's just, it's a given. Even if they're in bags, we're gonna lose color on all of our books. So it's, sometimes it's important for me to get better books out here where the pages are whiter because I can't, I can't influence where people have been keeping their stuff. I, I've heard but, that, I've heard that. Um that assertion that, that better books come out of certain areas, and I, I have to say I haven't seen it. I haven't seen that. I will say, generally speaking, you know, stuff that's coming out of the Denver area is usually cleaner because they're so high up and it's thin air and it's dry and cool. It's everything's perfect. But what I usually see is even even stuff that's been in an attic, and an attic's probably an attic or, or or like those independent storage bins, probably the two worst places. You may as well throw it in a microwave. So hot. I've actually had a guy call me and say, hey, I got you know, these comments up in my, my grandma's attic. I'm like, yeah, so what? He, he describes it as Batman 1 on top. So I'm like, oh, great. He says, well, how do you get them down? So I don't even know how to respond to that. Like, um, uh, you know, what? He goes, well, how do you get them down from the attic? You take one of the boxes from the back. He goes, no, if you touch them, they just crumble. So I didn't even go, look. Yeah, I don't want to see it. Yeah. But, uh, but this is what I did find. If, if they're compacted, and by that I mean if they're in and there's weight on them so air didn't get to them, those things are nice. And they could be from, you know, Hell's Pass, New Mexico, and they'll be nice. That's how the Mile High, the, the most they valuable will be nice. collection in the world was found in stacks vertically. And they're unbagged. Unbagged, for some reason, they come out better. I, I think because they were original owners and put away. I think the bagged collections I end up buying aren't original guys, I think. They're put together. I, Put together collections. The guy went out and a fan went and put those yeah, together. It wasn't somebody who's well, not 80 years right. old. Well, you well, know, I find it interesting that you know you talk about conservation and stuff that the way stuff gets run. I mean, I put my comics in either Mylar's or Mylights 25 years ago. Right. Uh, if you look at co comics that were in bags from that era, and you take one out, half the cover is on the yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. half the color. <laughs> and so. You know, you, you tried to conserve back then, but the difference in the materials, I mean, if you weren't into Mylars or Mylites back then, you know, your books have lost a lot of that gloss. You had to, you had to, you have to replace the bag every three, four years. And, and they, they said that it was, um, it was, it was Gerber, Ernie Gerber, right. actually it was a new chemistry, the chemistry behind it. He said, you know, the, 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 thing, the, the thing is that the poly bags, I don't care what they are, they're, they're oil-based, and they, all, they have a migratory. The, the, the thing that makes them flexible is the thing that leaks out. So if you took that out, you end up with a hard shell. Um, to me, you know, I, I just bagged stuff and didn't bag it, whatever. You know, I had a friend that went to work for the Library of Congress, and just when we were having beer one night down in Georgetown, he said, uh, you know, they keep everything in my alarm. So that was enough for me. And I've just done that ever since. And, you know, as a dealer, I probably spend more on uh, supplies than guys spend on their collection in a year. Oh, yeah. You know, just because of the volume of stuff I got to chew through. I mean, it's nothing to spend a thousand dollars a month on bags and boards. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we, but I don't. Uh, for my stuff, personal stuff, I put it in a mylar. I don't put it back in board. 
Yeah. I, I guess it doesn't so. need it because the backing board will actually you'll see you'll see yellow migration from stuff in there because the two things touching each other. I don't know the chemistry, but it seems to me. But you gotta let the you gotta take the lids off once in a while. You gotta air them out. Yeah, or read them. That's read that's them. crazy yeah. enough. Yeah, it's it's important to actually read your comics. It's healthy to read your comics. You, you, the, the, other thing, the other thing, the other thing I would throw out there, it, 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 we're talking about investment, and before before because I would really like to get some. People, I actually get people, I've been doing it long enough, they ask me, hey, would you help me invest? And oh, certainly. How fast do you want to turn them around? Because I think they don't think, of, they, they, they think they can buy it. There's that commercial on TV, right, where the guy buys something at an auction, you go, okay, I want to sell it. Right. Like, well, how fast do you want to hold this thing? You want to hold it for 10 years, 15, three, because it's a big difference in what I would tell you to, to invest in. You only want to hold it for three years. We got to go with like no risk stuff, right? You want to go with the golden age Captain America. If you pay, if you don't get ripped off, you know, you, where you paid somewhere around guy for a golden age Captain America year after year, in about three years, you should be able to sell it back to a reputable dealer at at least what you paid for it. And if you hold it for longer than three years, you should start to make money. Well, guys are well, gee whiz, I don't know, you know, I only make money. Well, if you buy a stock, how long? I mean, honestly. If you invest in the stock market, how long does it take? It takes about four years to make any money. And, what's your and the risk is insane. We just saw that last year. You know, you lost 40 grand overnight. And there's there's a risk with investing in any medium. Yeah, but, but there are what makes this Captain America unique is in that room. There might be five maximum copies of that Captain America, and 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 there's probably less. And it's been a cornerstone collector yeah, collectible since day one. Yeah, since the book came out, it's it's a it's a fantastic book. Right. And in that, when we're talking about investment grade, truly any grade, any grade. as long as there isn't uh, huge pieces out of the cover, somebody's going to go after the book. Right. So um, yeah, and the great thing with when he talks about buy it now, sell it in three to five to ten years, is that there are always emerging markets for people to resell their books. You can set up at a local convention for under a hundred bucks. You can go on eBay and, and throw it out to the entire world at a very nominal cost. You know, for big books, paying ten percent to a big auction house or an online thing, that's nothing when you take into account how much vendors and, and retailers pay for their overhead. Ten percent is what I mean. And uh, and you know, certain things you will have a market on. If this whoever if the owner of this thing put it online and put a fair market value as a buy it now, it will be gone within seven days. And that's a that's a speed that, that blows comic dealers' minds today. Could you imagine getting paid for just about anything you put online in seven days if somebody wanted it? It's, it's remarkable. Well, that being said, if somebody said, well, geez, I'm a, I'm a buy and hold guy. You know, I have, I've, uh, most of the guys that come and say, hey, would you help invest or at least discuss it, have just come into some windfall. So you have family, a family, the death in the family, or something happened and they've come across the money and said, well, you know, I'm not interested in selling for 10 or 20 years. Well, at that point, you would, you would maybe do some more risky things, and you may actually, it may actually steer the guy to invest in things that aren't of a large dollar amount now, but seem to have the ability to, 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 to you know, uh, a good example would be when, when um, the Carters bought the Mile Highs from Chuck, Chuck Rosansky bought the Mile Collection and he immediately parted out. And the guys that tried to buy them also were, were the Carters. And they went after the DCs, they went after the blue chip, you know, the DCs, the Timelys. And Gary actually said, you know, in hindsight, looking back, I should have bypassed that stuff and gone for the ACGs and the Nadors, because they were five and ten dollars a top guy. The amount of money that they appreciated to even get to five hundred dollars was in the, the multiple was insane. So a guy that comes to me and says he wants to do a long term, we'd mix some scarier um, things in there to have some risk that they may never go up at all. But if one of them catches fire, the return on your dollar is huge. You know.